Our final speaker is Andrew Hill, right? Yes, Andrew Hill, who's the Chief Science Officer at CartoDB, and is going to talk to us about that uh, software, which sounds pretty cool. Hi there. I'm, I'm actually going to, is this close enough, by the way? I, okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about, about kind of maps in general, because that's my favorite talk sort of to give. So um, bear with me. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what we do at CartoDB um, and, and what we're building, but I, really this is way more general than that. Uh, I thought I'd start out this talk because um, I, I really like hackathons, and I really love hackathons that are about science. Um, and, that's, and so let me tell you a little bit about who I am uh, and where that love comes from. So I, I like to tell who I am by actually telling who I'm not anymore. Um, and the first thing I'm not anymore is a biologist. Uh, although I got my PhD at the University of Colorado studying global biodiversity. Now, when you think global biodiversity, you think all these like charismatic, beautiful animals. And it's true, that's global biodiversity. But when you end up studying global biodiversity, you end up studying animals like this quite often. And so this, this is uh, the Smithsonian Natural History Collection. And so these are all animals that were collected out in the field and then brought back to a museum. And I, I was studying this, but I actually never even really studied the, the animals coming from the drawers like this. I actually studied the data that we were extracting from that and trying to tell big, big, big picture stories about that data. And along the way, I, I visited the second thing I'm not, which is I'm not a developer. And it's part of why I love hackathons. Um, but it, it's, it's because as a biologist, I learned how to program. And I learned how powerful that was. Like when I first learned how to do a for loop, and I was like, wow, I can go through an entire spreadsheet and do this thing, this magical thing that I want to do. It was very much this feeling that I think a lot of developers get when they first, when they first learn how to develop. Um, and then through my combination of, of data and biological data and development, I, I ended up making a lot of maps. Um, this is a map that I, I show when I give this little piece of my presentation that I'm, I would be normally very embarrassed about, but I made this 10 years ago. Um, and I was actually doing my master's at the time, and I was studying epidemiology. And I qu quickly realized that if we could use mapping tools a little bit differently, we could start actually asking different questions about our data. And so here I was taking phylogenetic trees and projecting them on Google Earth. It was just bought by Google, and it was a very interesting new technology to just see what was possible. Um, but I did a lot of hacking on data and data visualization and always kind of going back to maps. So here, when I was working on my PhD, I was looking at niche models um, and seeing if we could build online applications around displaying that data. I became friends with a company called Visuality, who actually does a lot of a lot, did a lot of projects in a, in a couple different domains. One of them actually was citizen science. Uh, we worked on a project with the Kepler data. We, it was a project called Planet Hunters. It's still going. Um, you you go online and you try to mark up those light waves that are coming from the planets to try to t detect where where or coming from the stars to detect where planets are. Um, but primarily, Visuality worked on on applications for scientists and for conservation groups. Um, to, to put data online, to, to build tools around that data, and to communicate what they were doing with science and with data better. It was primarily in, in areas like this, studying things about environments. So this is a cool tool called the Carbon Calculator, and you can calculate carbon storage for different protected areas and changes to those protected areas. We also branched out a little bit there. Um, but if you went to our old website, you just see this giant gallery of projects. And, and we realized that we were continuously building maps for our, our clients to make, to, to make their stories better and more powerful and more approachable. Um, and we realized that the best, the best way we could do good for the world through maps was just to build a better mapping tool. And so we built CartoDB with this idea that people could map everything. We could all just come together if we had a better, easier tool to make maps with. And so we did, we, you, it runs, you just log in in your browser, and then you take a, you take a file from your desktop and you drag it onto your on your Chrome tab or Firefox tab or whatever it is, uh, and it goes and it, it loads that data up into the cloud, and then you magically get this um, table, and then the table is your data, but you can also modify and manipulate that data, mix it with other data, but really the, the, the piece that you're looking for is that you get a map, and it's an interactive map online that then you can publish other, other places and tell stories with and in, in, um, connect it with other media, and it's, it's a very like, po powerful and sort of uh, flexible tool that we're building. And so we started this um, almost four years ago, I guess it's about three and a half years ago now, um, to, to let people map everything, and now everybody's mapping. It's really crazy the number of people that are signing up for this service, and, and they're making maps, and they're using geospatial technology to do really incredible things. Um, 
And so now, you know, looking back at my past and my starting with mapping, mapping my data from epidemiology and, and moving through biodiversity informatics and, and now working for a company that makes a mapping tool, I, I find myself oftentimes reflecting, like, why maps? Why through all these like stages of, of my development and in, in, in the world did we end up going to maps to do better data communication for science? Why did we use it for better data communication for humanitarian needs? Why do we use it to communicate anything? And so I started thinking about that a lot more and I wanted to share with you some of the things that I think that are pretty interesting. Um, when you're a scientist or when, when you're somebody that works with data quite a lot, oftentimes you'll sit there and you'll try to explain to somebody across the table from you what it is that you work on. And if you explain to them long enough the data that you work on or the problems that you try to solve with data, oftentimes you'll look deep down into their eyes and you'll see something kind of like this. Data ends up being very hard to, to, to communicate to people through words alone. But let me show you something, and this is one of my favorite slides to show to people in New York. Um, because the story that I want to tell you about this is in New York. So I, I live here in New York. and. Um, and I, I, I'm always going to the subway to get someplace, right? And there's this weird thing when you're going to the subway that no matter, like, no matter what you're doing, when you're going to the subway, there's this anxiety you're going to miss the next train. And so you're always in kind of this like rush to get down, the, down to the platform so you don't miss that next train. And inevitably, when you're in a rush, the, the more of a rush you're in, the more likely you're going to run into somebody going slow down those steps down to the platform. And so that person that's walking slow in front of me, I really want to get around them. And I finally get around them, and, I, and I'd say like, you know, 50% of the time that slow person is on their phone, and they're doing something, okay? And some percentage of that time, they're sending a text message. That's fine, I'll give them a pass, I don't really mind. But some other percentage of the time, you notice that they're actually on a map, and they're looking at a map that describes their place. And this is the map, this is the Google map that they're looking at. And what, what I think is so amazing about that, and so like, so, so uh, sort of inspiring and, and gives me a lot of wonder is that this map doesn't have any reality. There's this person that's trying to navigate reality. They're on the staircase getting to the place that they actually need to go that has a map at the bottom of the staircase that describes that place perfectly. Yet they're so engrossed in this map that, that pretends to explain this reality, but it doesn't. So if you look at this, it's actually, there's no reality in it. It's actually just a giant data visualization problem. And what Google does so well is they actually strip a lot of data. Google's power here is their editorial. They actually pull all the data that you don't need to see just to show you the pieces that let you get engrossed in it and navigate your space. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. How do they just show these images and get people lost in it thinking that that's their real space? So I thought more about it and I went to lunch one day at work and I came back and I started watching videos of this. Does anybody know what this is? Or, uh, you, you, usually there's a couple of parents in the audience and they raise their hands. Parents know this really quickly. So this is a, this is a character from this cartoon, Dora the Explorer. And in Dora the Explorer, there's this character, I, I never remember if it's Map or Mappy or, any, anyway, so this is the map. And in Dora the Explorer, the map, he dances around, he sings songs, and he explains the challenges that they're going to have throughout the day. And what I think is so interesting about this is when I started watching, I was like, wow, they're using a map to educate uh, uh, young people. Uh, that's really interesting. Why did they choose a map? And then I started watching it more and I was like, wait a second. No, no, this is way more complex than that. This is a map that is actually a human. It's dancing around as a happy face. It's telling stories. But it's not only that, it's this character that's a map that's dancing around on a map. This is a very, very complex setting here to be educating a young person. But they pull it off really well, and this map will give them all these clues about how the day, how this cartoon is going to unfold. And I started wondering, you know, are they using this map uh, to teach young people how to use maps? Or are they using the map because the young people already know pretty well or are able, able to abstract this map and understand that it describes some real space? And I, and I tend to um, lean towards the latter. And I think that's what we do as scientists quite often, is we take the map that is the real space, something that people can abstract and understand that it describes the world around them, and then we layer on pieces of visualization. We lay on the narrative that we want to tell so that we can slide it into that thing they already believe. And that happens all the time. And so uh, a journalist actually clued me into this. I thought it was really amazing. So I went to this conference with a bunch of journalists, and we were talking about data visualization in this breakout session that I was in. And she said, 
Data visualization, data visualization is very hard if you're a journalist, because unless you know your, your demographic, unless you know your readers so well, you can't just put a piece of data visualization in the news because you'll lose them. If you put a bar chart or a line graph or whatever it is, people don't necessarily want to approach that and dig into it and understand what you're trying to tell them. She said, except for a map. We put a map in the news every morning, and that's the weather. And I, I had like this mini, mini mind explosion. And then I went home and I thought about it more, and I was like, wow, it's even more profound than that. They, they don't just look at this map. They're not just willing to look at this map in the news, but they actually change their behavior from it. Every day, people look at the weather map, and they decide what they're going to wear. They decide how they're going to get to work. They decide what they're going to do over the weekend. So people are changing their behavior through data visualization. And again, this is a really big science problem. This is big data that they're putting into a map to, con to contextualize and tell about your world. Let me tell, tell you one more fun example. So there's an artist, uh, and she went around Manhattan, and she had self-addressed envelopes. And she handed these envelopes out to random people, and she asked them to draw Manhattan and send them back to her. And so the envelopes came back, and um, she made it into a book. And you go, go to Amazon and buy that book and see all these people's different interpretations of Manhattan. And I love this, this map. And it uses a feature of, of maps that Google Maps and Dora the Explorer and most maps that you see use, and it's a feature called salient features. So if you look at this, there's no Manhattan here. But you know it's Manhattan through the salient features, things like Central Park and Broadway. And I can never tell if that's Canal or Houston. But I know, I know roughly. And, and the shape of it is very familiar, the coastline. And so this combination of, of salient features, I know this artist is talking about Manhattan. So then this artist, artist layers on some narratives, some things that this artist wants to tell me about the world. And the first one is something like, um, in the, in, the, uh, in the north, it's like, stayed here, it was pretty good. OK, cool. So if I was coming to New York, I might not be that interested in going up there. And, and then in the, in the middle there, it's uh, stayed here, and it was the best. OK, wow, that's awesome. But then the artist loses all authority for me. So if you look in the lower, in the lower left, the artist is like, also stayed in Brooklyn, and that sucked. Well, for me, Brooklyn is a salient feature. And I know that Bre Brooklyn doesn't suck, and I know that Brooklyn is actually to the right. OK? So this artist didn't use that didn't use that correctly enough for me to believe this authority of New York. OK, so that's my little, uh, my little bit on, on maps and the power of maps. And maps are like so many other things in this world. And they're really powerful. But the power of it and the, and the utility of it and the technology that we have behind it is accelerating. It's accelerating really fast. And sometimes we don't think about maps as this technology that we're actually building on and making better. So it's just like computing. It's just like space travel. It's just like all these other things. So this, was, this is one of the earliest known maps. It's a, it's a map of a, a village, and it was drawn um, uh, on a wall in, in modern-day Turkey. It's 8,000 years old. Okay? And you can look at it, and you can tell that it's a map. And so we kind of lived with this, this like, representation of our world in a map for quite a long time. And then map makers got these ideas, not now, not in this date, but before then, I got this idea of using projections to actually ma mathematically describe our world so you could connect one place to another on, on a representation and know the distance between the two. This, this map is, um, it was to show you about uh, Gerard Mercator and this idea of being able to draw two places with a straight line and it navigate the world and, and explore the world. Um, or even later than that, so like 150 years ago, uh, John Snow in London, a lot of people look at this and they go, oh, like, uh, they misinterpret the story as like John Snow um, discovered that cholera was coming from this pump in Soho, London, and so he shut off the pump and he saved a lot of people. That's not actually what he did. He used the map in order to convince other people that cholera was, was in this one source of water. He already had the hypothesis that it was happening there. So what he did is he went, went around Soho, and he, he counted up. He tallied up all the people that were dying in the different households um, of, from cholera, and he plotted them on a map. And then he showed somebody. He said, look, that water pump is right in the middle. We need to shut that off. And they did it. And that was sort of uh, this predated germ theory. This is when people believed in the miasma theory that things were just bad air moving through the city and didn't really know how to fix things. OK, so they accelerate faster. We go to space. We take pictures from space. And then we launch constellations of satellites that let us collect data about where we are down to the, down to, well, at the time, down to like legally down to something like a football field. But then Reagan passed into a law, and Clinton enacted in 2000. Now you can like map to the distance of your kitchen sink um, where you are on Earth from all these satellites moving around space. 
So that's awesome. Um, computers come along and quickly we build applications that run on computers so that we can map things better and keep track of this data. We invent the internet and maps quickly go to the internet. And this idea of interactive maps um, and, and big companies make these maps so that you can navigate the world with cars or whatever, whatever their, um, their desire is. I like to think of 2006, 2005, when the Google Maps API came out and people started using it to put their own data back on maps very quickly. And these weren't, these weren't traditional map makers. These were people that just were interested in place. I like to think of that as the sort of Prometheus moment where we all grabbed the power of maps and we took it back for ourselves. And since then, there's been this amazing flourishing of technologies and companies that are making maps and, and creating data and helping us map the world. So projects like OpenStreetMap come along and OpenStreetMap is this gigantic open data set of people that are just mapping where roads are, where buildings are, where lampposts are, where curb ramps are, where everything about the world you can imagine, they're trying to map it so that we know where it is and it's in a data set that we can all use for free. Companies like Mapbox are trying to map the world and give you beautiful base maps of things in near real time. My own company, CartaDB, we're trying to build technology so you can use your own data and mix it with a lot of other data, source, data sources to map, map your own world. Planet Labs is trying to take images of the world every day. And frankly, Geo's just gone crazy. In New York, we have a meetup. Um, I took this screenshot quite a while ago, but it's called Geo NYC. We have something like 1,500 me members that every month are just waiting to get on the list so they can come and hear about other people's mapping projects. Uh, there's a subreddit called Map Porn. It has, I, I, don't know, I don't remember the number, like a quarter or a half a million people that are just waiting to upvote the latest map that they see that they think is interesting and beautiful. I made this map just because. And this is a map of every river in the United States with the direction of the river um, is, is colored. Or the, every river is colored by the direction it flows. I use the same data set to then um, take a real-time feed of, of weather coming from NOAA and look at where it was raining to tell you exactly which rivers were being rained on. This is a map from a scientist, and he tracked a, a bunch of seagulls, or gulls, and he, he took one gull, named it Eric. So this is Eric the bird, and you can see the life pattern of Eric the bird over the course of June to July. And you can see that he has this like, profound shift in his, in his life pattern. It's because of a couple of reasons. One is he has a nest, and he's, and he's raising a family towards later in the season. But really, earlier in the season, he's being sort of a parasite. And he goes, he goes into the country, and he follows tractors around that are seeding in early spring, and he's picking up their seeds and getting a free lunch. This is another map. This is a Spencer the Cat. This is a map in Andover, Massachusetts that was tracked by scientists. There's a really cool project called movebank.org. And it takes a lot of scientific papers, takes their data of animals moving. So this is one cat from there. This is Spencer uh, moving around his neighborhood. Digital Globe is taking images that are so high resolution, you can see the difference between a car door open and a car door closed. Uh, Stamen is designing maps that you can zoom all the way into your house, and they're, and they're styled in a way that looks like somebody watercolored them. A company here in Brooklyn will, hand, will, will laser cut your, your neighborhood or town. There's a, a meetup called Map Time. It's in something like 50 locations. And they're just people that come together every month or multiple times a month and spend an evening learning the tools to make maps. Okay? They're just trying to learn how to do these things. So what the hell maps? OK, so I want to tell you a little bit about the maps of today and how that's feeding into the maps of tomorrow. And some things that I think that are changing really fast are, uh, I think I'm going to show you three or four. And one of the ones that I think is really important that's happening right now, uh, our maps are becoming less of a professional tool. You don't have to be an expert at cartography. You don't have to be an expert at geography in order to use a map and do interesting things with it. And so these two worlds are starting to influence and draw from each other in really big and interesting ways. In fact, some, some map makers slash technologists have built tools to bring even the design of maps closer to the way that we design for the web. And then they're able to make these. So this is a data set of taxis in New York City. And I forget which airport this is, JFK or, or uh, LaGuardia. But um, it's taxis coming and taxis, or taxis with a passenger and taxi, taxis without. And you can see that you can see this sort of um, point cloud. And you've already seen this one. But then this, this, this scientist is able to take this data and try to communicate what he's up to, but also take two different goals and give you this sort of artistic view of what's different between the life patterns of two, two goals. Here's um, Twitter data. Uh, and so, so the map maker here pulled a bunch of data from Twitter. Um, and this is Ebola. And you can see that a lot of people in the world are, are talking about Ebola. 
and, and actually, the timing of this is that Ebola hasn't erupted in the US, but you know where it happened first? And the US goes crazy talking about Ebola. Another scientist actually um, did some modeling. Uh, it was a group of scientists, and they did some modeling. They took the data from a buoy in San Francisco, and they modeled the tides in the San Francisco Bay the night of the Alcatraz escape. And they made some maps, and, and pretty much every, um, every online uh, newspaper, or newspaper with an online site ended up putting these, this story and map online. So what they did is they modeled the night of the tides, and then they did some modeling of particles every hour of the night as those particles were dropped into the tide to see where these prisoners could have floated to. And then they dropped it into CartoDB. And so you can see different colors for each hour of the night. So it's somebody jumps that hour, somebody jumps that hour. And my favorite is this red blob. Because you can imagine the prisoners just being like, oh, so like swept out at sea and so lost and so scared out in the Pacific. But then as the evening goes on, the tide shifts. And the way the tide shifts, if you've ever, if you've ever heard about the San Francisco Bay, it's a lot of water moving. And so watch these red particles come flying back in and going back under the Golden Gate Bridge and probably cheering on their way to Oakland or Berkeley or wherever they end up. Maps are moving beyond history. A lot of the maps that we make, actually most of the maps we make, use data that we've already collected, right? That's the way that it has to be. I, I have a friend, he makes maps um, for extreme athletes, and so this is a girl who tries to go everywhere under her own power. Uh, she cross continents, countries, whatever it is. Here she's trying to go around the world, and so this is a map of her attempt to go around the world, sometimes on foot, sometimes on bikes, sometimes on whatever. Here she's in a rowboat trying to go from Japan to Alaska, and he was showing me this map, and she's like stuck in this little <whistles> And I was like, wow, how long was she stuck there? And he said, a week. And I was like, wow, okay. Here's some data that I collected. Uh, this is a heat map of my own life. I wrote a little app on my phone that writes it to CartoDB. Uh, and, and I can just look at it sometimes and see my life history. Here I live, here I, I moved my house in Brooklyn, and my office is still in Manhattan. And then I moved my office over to Williamsburg. And you can see how my life kind of changed in those couple, couple of days. Uh, Waze comes along, and it's mapping the road right in front of you as somebody collected that data, and it comes to your phone that there's a pothole or there's an accident or whatever it is. And like I mentioned, Planet Labs is trying to collect this data so fast. We work with a project that tries to map deforestation, and you know that deforestation happens all the time. And it's a very hard thing to think of a static map that describes our forest if that map isn't changing. So we help them build maps like this so that people can dig in to a zoomable interactive map but replay the places of deforestation over time, over something like the last six or eight years, but down to the last 16 days. And we're partnering with um, satellite providers like Digital Globe, who, who are able to take images like this. So this is Burning Man last summer. This is amazing. This is more Twitter data. This is one of my favorite maps from Twitter. And these are people mentioning the word sunrise on Twitter. And you can see the actual sunrise moving across the globe. Watch this. This giant real-time biosensor. OK, another thing that's changing is that the maps that we see never have to be the same. We still think, we still think of maps that unfold, and you look at them from the back seat of your car. That's not true. And I showed, you this, I showed you this weatherman before, but you know it's not true for the weather anymore. We don't get the weather like that anymore. We get the weather hyper-personalized just for you. And maps can be just the same. So we have all these technologies for us to redesign and, and mani manipulate the data that ends up in your map. And so the place that you look at never has to be the same as the place I look at. And we see that already. Google does it for countries. So depending on which country you're in, you're going to see borders differently. And depending on, on your user preferences and your background, you may see, see things on your base map differently as you're navigating the city. And so what you see never has to be the same as what I see. And if you're a map creator, if you're an application creator, you can think of the map as the same sort of canvas to tell the different story for the different, the different um, viewer. So the last thing I want to talk, just show you and, and hint to you is this idea of the Disappearing Act. We know that maps and geo are, have now become pervasive in the technologies we use. And so a lot of times, you're using the technology behind a map without a map. So things like Tile, which let you uh, reconnect with things that you've, that you've disconnected from, or Beacon, which maps your movements and, and sends you advertisements or whatever it is, depending on the room that you're moving through and the aisle that you're in in a store. Geoloki, which can give you geofencing information about, like, if you go to the store, you can remember um, to, to pick up the, the milk. Or Tinder. I like to leave my talks on this slide because you don't get to talk to many scientists and leave a talk on, uh, on a Tinder slide. But Tinder is a giant map of singles in your neighborhood or, or your town. And as you move, that app remaps it for you without you knowing. 
So finally, if you're interested in these things, check out CartoDB. Uh, we do some really cool stuff. Um, it's free to use, so, so go sign up. Um, or just check out our blog and read some of the projects that our users are, 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 were working on. Um, and ask me any questions. I'd, I'd love to talk to you more about maps. So thanks. thanks. Any quick questions for Andrew? Oh, in the back, yep. Which method do you like using? The old method, which is charting, and using the original satellite, which is the moon, or digital communication, i.e. satellite, for mapping? Which method do you prefer? Uh, well, I, don't, I definitely don't know the older methods of, of stars and maps, or uh, stars and the moon, for sure. Um, example, Say that. charting. Kepler yeah. is an example of charting, or if you're on a boat yeah, using yeah. GMT, long, longitude, latitude, yeah. that is charting. Which method do you like prefer? Digital communication using the satellite where you Google search and you automatically get a map on your phone or your laptop, or charting, which is a white sheet of paper knowing latitude, longitude, right. knowing all the Earth is and where things are located, right. and using the original satellite, which is the moon. Which method would you prefer? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely a technologist through and through, and I think, that, I think that there's a lot to be informed in the digital method from older methods. But I think that when you, when you rely on the digital methods, it gives you this sort of, um, gives you this sort of like quickly accelerating platform that you can do some pretty powerful and far out things. And so your ability to navigate to your subway station during, during, during rush hour is a very different thing than navigating through charting, right? And so we can build on top of that as app developers or scientists or whatever it is to take, to take, um, to leverage location a lot more powerfully, I think. Okay, any other questions for Andrew? Let's thank him again. Thanks.